Welcome to this interview with Professor Dr. Maureen Nehart. Dr. Nehart is a licensed American clinical psychologist with 30 years of experience working with children with special needs and their families. She has worked as a secondary teacher, school counselor, gifted program coordinator, clinical and consulting psychologist. In addition to that, she worked as associate professor and deputy head of psychological studies at the National Institute of Education in Singapore. She is a frequent conference speaker and has presented approximately 300 papers, workshops, and keynotes at state, national, and international conferences. Dr. Nehart has been a member of the American Psychological Association since 1990 and is a former member of board of directors for the National Association for Gifted Children. She serves on the editorial review boards of three journals in gifted education and writes a regular column in a national teaching magazine in the US. Her research interests include the social and emotional development of gifted children, home and school-based psychological interventions for children at risk, resilience, and the psychology of high performance. Her latest book is the second edition of the social and emotional development of gifted children. What do we know? Dr. Nehart brings a pragmatic systems perspective to support the children at risk. Dr. Nehart obtained her PhD in counseling psychology from the University of Northern Colorado in 1991, and her MA in gifted education in 1985 from the same institution. She completed a one-year doctoral internship in clinical child psychology in 1989 at the Children's Medical Center in Oklahoma. She has experience providing direct services to children at risk in inpatient hospital settings, residential treatment centers, outpatient counseling centers, and the schools. She has been widely sought after as a consultant and a trainer for more than 20 years and has trained teachers, counselors, psychologists, and medical personnel in different parts of the world. The International Center for Innovation in Education is very pleased to meet with Dr. Nehart. So my first question is, uh, who are you? Well, I have many identities like all of us, but um, you're probably wanting to know professionally what I do. Uh, I'm a child psychologist and a former teacher, classroom teacher, uh, and I'm a person of faith. That's an important part of my identity and a wife and a mother. And when did you start working in this field and why? Ah, well, I began uh, the second day of my first year of teaching because I had a student in my class that I realized in the midst, I was teaching science, in the midst of an activity, I realized that this child probably had already mastered the science curriculum for the year. And I quickly flashed in my mind, I was very young, of course, and I thought, what do I know about really smart children? And I had learned a lot in my training about what to do with kids with disabilities, but I realized I really hadn't learned anything about what to do with a child who had already mastered the curriculum. And fortunately, I was in a school district where they had a gifted program, there was a gifted coordinator, and I called her right away and said, I'm going to need some help with this child. And I began working with her and then that launched it. Uh, what are your most significant accomplishments and contributions at both local and international levels? Because I remember when I started my studies in this field and uh -huh. was, I was searching for example for literature, I found, you know, uh, from near in the 90s that you are you already there. And mm -hmm. you wrote about many issues relating to the social emotional development of the gifted students. Mm -hmm. Yep, I mean, on a personal level, I think, uh, 
you know, what, what feels most meaningful to me are the contributions that I made in the lives of individual kids and families. I can remember some of them very well, you know, and that, that's what's really rewarding. Um, on, a, on a larger scale, what I feel really good about and surprised by, honestly, is the feedback I've had on uh, three articles in particular. Uh, the Profiles of the Gifted, the typology that George Betts and I developed way back in the late 80s and then revised in 2010. That's been translated, I, I don't know in how many languages that's been translated into, and it's published everywhere. Uh, people, you know, various countries put it on their websites, their government websites, whatever. So I've gotten a lot of feedback from um, university professors in particular that it's been really useful in training teachers and helping parents. And then I published an article in 2000 on gifted children with Asperger's syndrome. We still had that diagnosis at that time. And that was another one that I uh, really wrote for my own purposes to kind of organize my thinking when we were becoming more aware about autism spectrum disorders. Uh, but again, I got quite a bit of feedback from families that that was a really helpful um, article. And then the text that uh, the first edition that we wrote with Sally Reese and Nancy Robinson and Sydney Moon, The Social and Emotional Development of Gifted Children, we did that as a service publication. Uh, that became a widely used graduate textbook in graduate education courses. And so that, of course, is very rewarding to know that the work that we've done has had an impact internationally. And that was also recently revised with um, Stephen Pfeiffer and Tracy Cross. So it continues to be used as a graduate text around the world, Middle East, Europe, um, Asia, United States. So yeah, that's very rewarding. We, because we don't have, you know, other, uh, we can say textbook or an mm -hmm. international reference we can use. Right. Yeah. And yeah. then you moved to Singapore. Yes. Yes. In yeah. 2006. Yeah. Changed my life. Changed your life. So can you Changed tell my us, life. Can you tell us about your experience in Singapore? Sure. Um, th there's a lot to tell. I'll try to be succinct. Um, first, let me say that uh, maybe you can relate to this to go from you know, to go from living in the West and being a Western person to live in Asia is I really felt the first two years in particular, like I was being turned inside out and upside down. It was very uh, challenging. It was really exciting, but it was also exceedingly difficult to adapt to uh, really Singapore is quite Chinese in many respects. It's not like China, but it is still very much a Chinese kind of society with Chinese values. And I was working at a university that had a long Chinese tradition. And so, you know, making those adjustments was really difficult. I remember once saying to myself, am I even going to know who I am at the end of this experience? Uh, but it was very exciting and terrifically rewarding. And uh, I miss it terribly. I can't wait to get back. And then you start, uh, or I cannot say start, but you continue building your networks. Uh, yes. Networks yeah. uh, with Europe and other countries. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. I got really interested in the overlap between culture and context and children's development. And, and I don't know if you are aware that although I continued to publish in gifted education, um, I began to do research in autism and I got really passionately interested in mobile health as a solution to the challenge of access to evidence-based health care, particularly in the developing world. Um, the need is just so phenomenal and we'll never have enough professionals to do the job. Um, so I got quite involved with mobile health research. No, this is very true. And what type of competences contributed to your success and to become an international scholar? Uh, well, uh, the magnanimity of, first of all, other people, not just, I mean, yeah, I had some competencies, but I also really was extended a great deal of grace and generosity by um, others who were giants in the field, George Betts and Nancy Robinson in particular, really mentored me and offered me a lot of opportunities. Um, and so that, 
you know, that was really grace in my life and enabled me. I think personally, both a strength, probably my number one strength and also my weakness as so many strengths are, is my very intense curiosity. I just cannot let some things go. I get very curious about things and I pursue them relentlessly until I'm satisfied. Um, and so that uh, has probably enabled me to do some things. And then uh, I wasn't so aware of it, but other people have said that I'm terribly focused. You know, I'm, I'm really focused. So yeah, so maybe that also, I can stay with something uh, for quite a while. Do you think I could say that maybe Nancy Robinson was your mentor and who is your best mentee? Oh, what was the first part of that question? I said maybe Nancy Robinson was your colleague and mentor, mentor who offered you mentorship or maybe other people, I don't know. Yeah, and George Betts, is, certainly. George Betts, yeah. yeah and yeah. Uh, who is your best mentee? Ooh, mm, that is, <laughs> um, that would be hard to say because you know what's difficult about that is I've mentored people in different uh, competencies or in different fields even. So like in mobile health, uh, my, my, uh, I have very fond, um, very fond feelings and strong relationship with Dr. Gloria Law, who was one of my PhD students uh, in autism research, mm. and she's carrying that work forward. Uh, but then I've mentored a, in gifted education. I've mentored so many people in different ways. It would be hard to, uh, we could be here all day highlighting what's special about different ones. Now, this is a different question. Uh, okay. Why do you think that we have more women in gifted education than men? Well, we have more women in education uh, than men no, no. generally. So I think it's largely a reflection of that. And I think that's due uh, in, in large part to sociocultural factors. You know, women were always, it was the one option that was available for women as a career. But interestingly, recently, I've been reading a little bit of the latest brain research about gender differences. And I really wonder if also education doesn't attract women maybe more than men because it's a good fit for uh, their brains. This implies that there are differences in priorities or profiles of gifted men and women? Well, I don't know about gifted so much as gifted men and women specifically, but there are certainly differences in the brains of men and women, and there's differences in how men and women are socialized also. Uh, so, you know, it gets difficult to uh, narrow that down real specifically across cultures and context because there's so much, there's so many differences in culture. And I'm not familiar enough with brain research across cultures uh, mm -hmm. to be able to speak on that, I think, in particular. Thank you so much. What research excites you at the moment? You were talking about oh, citizen. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> what I'm really you know, what I'm really passionate about at the moment, honestly, has nothing to do with gifted education, per se. It has to do with mobile health. I'm very excited about mobile health. Uh, and mobile health, I, I mean specifically about, and mobile learning partly too, but really mobile health, um, because that is such a need internationally that we now have the capacity to put, to make, give access to evidence-based health interventions on your phone, on your phone. You know, I mean, it's just remarkable. It's absolutely remarkable. And I'm kind of anxious about it. I don't know why it's not happening faster. I, and I kind of know why it's not happening faster. And I know there are teams working on it, but it's just gonna, it's just gonna explode. You know, we're, we're gonna do healthcare very differently in the next, in 10 years. And what, I'm excited what, about that. What characterize, hmm? uh, what characterize or what characteristics, you know, uh, we could know about uh, such mobile health? Uh, well, let me give you a couple of examples. Yes. Uh, first of all, currently we have 
quite a bit of availability, as people kind of know, to monitor health conditions with people's phones. So we can monitor a wide variety of um, health concerns with the phone and with apps. We also know we've got thousands of apps, obviously, that do a lot of health related kinds of things. But unfortunately, what's not happening is systematic research about the um, efficacy of those apps. So that is still a really growing edge in the field. What we did in Singapore that was a very hard, really hard work, harder work than I've ever done, but very rewarding was that we made it possible to train a user. So someone with a phone, we made it possible for them to learn how to teach their young child with autism to talk. Okay, so imagine you're a parent of a young child with autism. Your child does not know how to talk. You are waiting for intervention or maybe interventions not available or maybe interventions, you can't afford intervention, I don't know. And, but you've got a phone, you've got an app on your phone that can teach you how to teach your child to talk. Now, this is, this is still in uh, research and development. We're scaling it. We did two studies, both were published, so my, uh, my student, who is now a senior psychologist in Singapore, she designed it, and we developed it, and we tested it. Uh, this was her PhD research. And uh, we were able to have parents were able to teach their young children with autism to talk while they were waiting for services. And then we tested it with preschool teachers who were working with young children with autism, and we were able to improve their skill level in teaching these young children to talk. Uh, so it, it was amazing to me because we never, I didn't expect to get such good results on the first run, but we did. And imagine the potential of that. Imagine the potential. And do you think it would be uh, applicable or could be used with other uh, types of uh, problems we face with the gifted students? I think for it example, can be. I, if, yes, if it is applicable yes. for ADHD students, for example, or right, you know, students right. with learning disability, gifted students. That's with right. Learning disability. Yeah. Right. The idea, the idea is that it serves as a prototype. So we had a framework for the pedagogy, and um, you know, the, the challenge is is kind of figuring out what core skills a person needs because you can't put a lot of skills into an app. You know, so there's quite a bit of research involved in figuring out what needs to be in the app and how to deliver that in a meaningful way for the user. But yeah, the, essentially the prototype could be used for almost any kind of problem, uh, particularly any kind of behavioral or cognitive problem. So yeah, it's very exciting. I think it's very exciting. And did you, uh, uh, did you discuss the possibility to become like an international project? You are the developer and you are the person who created this uh, well, I'm not. My, my student was really. Yes. I supervised my supervision. Student. Yeah, but yes. uh, we did, you know, the challenge there, Tazir, we, we did look for international uh, international team. And we did, um, actually, we were approached um, by some researchers at Harvard, honestly, because the paper came out just as they were getting started. Uh, so uh, I'm, I know that there are people work teams that are working on this, big teams um, around the world, but there's a shortage. I, we experienced sort of a shortage of talent on this or, or a shortage of um, researchers. Qualified, it was qualified difficult. people, qualified people. Yeah, people. yeah, yeah. It was difficult to get people on board, yes. to find people who could, who could get on board. But really the potential is very high. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. yeah, it's very exciting. Yes. Really exciting work to do. Okay, when it comes to the gifted students, what does it mean well-being? Well, well-being is not just the absence of trouble or illness. Well-being is, we could say, thriving or life satisfaction, if you want to. And current thinking, uh, one of the popular theories, if you will, uh, in positive psychology is that there are five pillars to well-being. So it's positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning or purpose in your life, and accomplishment. And do you think giftedness has 
positive or negative impact on uh, psychological well-being? Well, that's a really big question. <laughs> That's a really big question, but there's a really simple answer to it that may not satisfy you. And it's two words, and that is it depends. The impact of giftedness on psychological well being really depends on culture and context. And by that, I mean the fit with the environment. So if you have a good fit, then you're good to go. But if you have a bad fit, then that's going to be a problem. So that means we have to investigate the environment. Right. Right. So, all right. So, just to elaborate on that, we could say that there are really, um, let's say, three things that you really have to have in place, minimally three things. One is an appropriate level of challenge. And by an appropriate level of challenge, I mean a level of work that requires some effort. So, they have to be presented with learning or tasks that uh, they have not mastered yet, but are ready to learn. So there's that gap between readiness and mastery. And then they have to have access to other people like themselves. We call them true peers, people who have similar interests, ability, and drive. And what happens to lots of gifted children around the world is they sit in classrooms with many children who are not like themselves. So then that is, you know, makes it really difficult for them to have access to other people like themselves. We are cognitively hardwired neurologically to be attracted to people who are similar cognitively. And unfortunately, in schools around the world, we group kids by age, generally, we group them by age. And so many gifted kids are advanced in their development. So they don't fit that well with kids their own age necessarily. Uh, so, and then the third thing they need is sort of flexible progression, some flexibility within the curriculum. And as you know, many school systems around the world are quite rigid and they lack alternative pathways. They lack flexibility. Kids are kind of stuck in a very rigid progression through a curriculum. And that can present difficulties for gifted children. And do you think we have the right intervention programs to overcome uh, over different issues, like you know bullying and other you know other types of issues. Uh, well, one of the things well, I know. We can see what are the most common issues you know when it comes to the gifted students. Yeah. Well. Okay. So let's talk about that for a moment here. Yeah. First, as you know, we have most countries we have a big gap between what we know in the research, what we know works, and applying that on the ground. Yeah. One of the things that was very exciting to me in Singapore, but also took my breath away, was very difficult, was how quickly they moved from research finding to national application. I mean, I saw thing, I saw research findings in one instance go from research finding to national application in three years. And in another instance, I saw it go in three months. You know, the government got really excited about a colleague's research finding. They said, we want to roll this out. We were all like, wait, 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 we, <laughs> we're not ready to roll this out. They said, no, we are rolling this out. Be ready in three months. And we're like, oh my gosh, we got to be ready in three months. You know, I mean, it's, it, was, it was crazy, but that's better, I think, than the alternative, which is to wait 20 years or more or never get there. Yes. And, you know, small countries, that have centralized governments and centralized education systems might be in a better position to move quickly and make changes that positively impact all children than larger countries that are much more difficult to monitor and or where you have a lot of decentralized educational processes. Yeah, so, and then what are the main common issues or the most common issues when it comes to the gifted students or gifted children? Well, again, that can depend a little bit on culture, you know, yes. and context, yes. but we can say broadly, I think, uh, certainly across uh, the developed world, that a common issue is that the work is too easy in school and they don't get sufficient challenge, particularly in the primary years. It gets better uh, when you get to the secondary years in most uh, developed countries for many kids, but not all. Kids who are gifted kids who are twice exceptional, who also have learning disabilities, they tend, I think, to really suffer uh, in many countries and in many contexts because they either get 
addressed for their learning disabilities, uh, they often do not get a sufficient challenge in their areas of strength and then, and then they're miserable. Um, so that's a big issue. And then similar to that, again, because of the rigidity of the school system in many contexts is the fact that they don't have access to other kids who are like them. And, and I then think you feel your alone. book addressed these issues in a very comprehensive way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. The gifted students have unique counseling and guidance needs. Will you please shed some light on this topic? Because so, I think you put the framework when mm -hmm. it comes to Singapore and maybe other countries, and then based on your contribution and experience, we would like to have an idea about you know the framework, the basis and foundations for the required counseling and guidance uh, services and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that uh, one of the things that counselors can do for gifted children that's really would be very helpful is helping them to make to kind of understand the difference between uh, faulty and valid feedback. Because many gifted people get in what um, Mary Elaine Jacobson calls invalid or faulty feedback. They're told there's something wrong with them. They're too intense. Uh, they're too curious. They ask too many questions. Uh, they need to not care so much. You know, they're, they're kind of get the message that something is wrong with them because they don't fit within this typical, this box of typical development. They're atypically developing. Uh, and so gifted people, gifted children kind of need help with clarifying what's really valid. Is anything valid in that or not? And understanding themselves and how their giftedness or their ability, if you don't like the word gifted, just how talent or ability impacts their relationships and their interaction with their environment and their response to things. So that self-awareness and understanding other people is really important. And how could we get parents more involved? Parents? You said how yes. could we get parents more involved? Yes. Well, I think education is really um, helpful for parents, making pa helping parents to be aware. I know a lot of schools around the world do a lot of work with parents. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you, again, here I had an idea that I have not been able to persuade anybody to do yet, but maybe if I talk to you about it, we can persuade somebody to do it. Mm -hmm. I, I get, you know, there's really no, there's really very little value in a workshop. You know, I mean, parents get some benefit, teachers get some benefit, but nowadays with technology, I wish that we had a podcast, you know, a podcast for gifted parents or podcast for teachers on a variety of topics where, teachers could, um, very short, maybe two minutes, you know, a menu, and teachers or parents could select, you know, the Davidson Institute, their, uh, their website is very good. A lot of people have really good websites up, but why are we still doing websites? Why can't we have a series of podcasts that are very short, less than five minutes, very brief, that people can listen to on a wide variety of topics? This would be very easy to put together, and again, you need a team to do this, and I've been surprised that I I have not been able to persuade people to do this. It is very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so you can you you already persuaded us you know to do this and we are willing to do it. And this is really very interesting. And uh, yes, parents are in need for something like this. Right. And there's really no need for every country and every group to recreate the same thing. We could we could create something internationally that would be available, you know. In our center, we are willing to do this, but uh, as you said, we have to to think about the team who could be involved in the, in doing this. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, will you please tell us about the teachers' rules in identifying gifted students uh, at risk? Uh, well, let's talk about what you mean by at risk, because kids can be at risk for all kinds of reasons. Do you mean generally, or are you thinking about something specific? In general. Uh, well, this is kind of an interesting question because, you know, in some contexts, what I've learned is that 
parents might be a little bit better at identifying a child at risk than the teacher in some cases, because parents are really expert on their children. But that's not always true. In some contexts, teachers can be better at identifying a child at risk. So on the one hand, the parent really knows the child very intimately and, and they see the child um, in an in, in intimate kind of context. But the teacher, on the other hand, can is more familiar with what's the range of typical development generally. An experienced teacher uh, really understands what what kind of variability is typical and what kind of variability lays outside the norm or what's typical. So, you know, for example, in Singapore, we did some research and we learned that the preschool teachers are probably better in that context at identifying a preschool child at risk than parents were. Parents tended to be overly concerned in that mm -hmm. context, in an Asian context. So this is a good example of how context can make a difference. Um, whereas in the US um, and maybe also in um, say Scandinavia, for example, uh, parents might be um, the better identifier of, of risk. And based on your experience, um... What is the percentage of gifted students who suffer, uh, for example, depression? Oh, th this is really interesting too, because again, uh, it might vary with context. So what we know from the research and what we have to keep in mind that you know, most of the research has been done in the US, the UK, yeah. Yeah. and maybe some in Australia. So there's a lot of the world that we don't have a lot of research on. And in those, in those areas, those countries, the research tells us quite clearly that gifted kids are not more at risk for depression as a group, as a large group. However, there are two subgroups of gifted children who could be at greater risk, actually I think maybe three, three subgroups, very small subgroups. One is twice exceptional kids. So we know that kids who have learning disabilities, for example, have a much higher chance of developing mood disorders, uh, particularly in early adolescence. Uh, so they need to be monitored for that. So twice exceptional kids are uh, much less likely to get a good fit in their environment. It's gonna be much more challenging for them to manage. And so they're more at risk for depression or anxiety than gifted kids who don't have learning disabilities are. And, and perhaps also maybe more so than kids who just have a learning disability but are typically developing otherwise. That I'm not as clear about. Uh, but I just saw, I don't know if you're familiar with this. Uh, you, um, I don't know if you know her, Laurent uh, Verdure. She's a neuro French neuroscientist in Paris. Have no. you heard that name before, no, Laurent no, Verdure? No. I, I just uh, ran across some of her work. So she's been, she's a neuro, let's see, a neurodevelopmental pediatrician, something like that, doing research on um, neurodevelopment of children and has written some about gifted children. And one of her doctoral students recently finished some doctoral research that they found the incidence of depression among French gifted children at 32% compared to something like 2% in the regular population. Mm -hmm. Now, I haven't had a chance to read that dissertation and and see you know what what size their sample was or what their methodology was but it's a it's an illustration of how context can can matter i can imagine knowing france the french culture and the french education system as i do somewhat that yeah you might have a higher incidence of depression among gifted children in france in the school system because there aren't you know, it's a quite a rigid system. There aren't many alternative pathways. Uh, they don't, they're much less likely to get a good fit with the environment perhaps. Um, so twice exceptional kids are more likely to be at risk for depression than gifted kids who do not have a learning disability. Also the highly gifted, kids who among the gifted are gifted, we sometimes call them also profoundly gifted. We're not saying that there's a level of giftedness at which you know, you kind of your mental health breaks down. No, that's not it. There's a level of giftedness at which it becomes very difficult to get a good fit with the environment. And if you're profoundly gifted, so if you're advanced by, by years in your development, oh my gosh, I mean, imagine if you're nine years old 
and you have more the cognitive development of a 15 or 14 year old and you're sitting in a primary three classroom, oh my goodness, it's, it's not difficult to imagine how you might get really depressed being in that situation. I mean, it would be mind numbing, you know, it, it could be, it could potentially be mind numbing depending on your personality and your temperament. So, you know, so these are the two uh, subgroups, the third one. Yeah, the, so the third one, yeah, the third, the, yeah, the third one we know much less about. So I'm reluctant to say too much about it. Let me, mm -hmm. Most of the research is with adults. Okay, we, we know almost nothing. There's very little research with creatively gifted uh, mm -hmm. children. So among creatively gifted uh, adults who are writers, poets, and visual artists. So it's limited. It's not creative scientists. It's not creative mathematicians. It's creatively gifted writers, poets, uh, visual artists. Uh, there is a, high, a significantly higher incidence of depression. And I've written a little bit about that. There's lots of, lots of writing about this, lots of literature about this. It's not huge numbers. Most creatively gifted adults do not have issues with depression. But the incidence is higher than you would find in the population of um, typically developing adults or even uh, gifted adults who are not necessarily creatively talented in those areas. And could it's we say that also extended to uh, cover or address uh, dropout of the school? You know, similar to what we uh, what you were talking about uh, the depression. Oh. Sure. Well, with the fit, you mean? Yeah. That it's an issue of fit? Sure. Um, you could, and you could also, and, but again, we don't have a lot of research about that, mm -hmm. but we also um, know that gifted children can have the same kinds of challenges that other kids have. You know, if your parents are both drug addicts or you're living in poverty mm -hmm. or you're, you've got parents with mental health issues and life is very difficult at home, then you're likely to have psychological difficulties and you may be at risk for dropping out of school as well. Giftedness doesn't make you immune to those kinds of challenges. And do you think we have more uh, gifted female students or female gifted students than uh, male gifted students? No. No, we have no. similar. Similar. Mm -hmm. What is the best process to assess the needs uh, of the gifted students? If you uh, would like to just uh, explain like the framework or... Sure. So, okay. So here's what I would do if I were, a, let's say, a counselor or somebody who wants to help a gifted child. Um, I would really look, pay attention to fit, first of all. In what way is this person gifted? And then do they have access to people who are like themselves, at least one person. You know, we have a huge body of literature about resilience. Lots of people, lots of children live through adverse circumstances and do very well. Circumstances do not determine outcomes in life. If they did, kids who have been abused would all do poorly as adults and kids who had every advantage would do well. And we all know that's not what happens. You have lots of people who were raised in very adverse circumstances who become amazing adults. Um, many of the eminent people, you know, some of the research on eminence, a high percentage of eminent people came from very troubled family backgrounds. Um, so having every advantage doesn't necessarily get you the outcomes that you want. But resilience, one of the best, the single best predictor of resilience, and by resilience, I mean thriving, really flourishing as an adult, uh, when you've come through adverse circumstances, the single best predictor is a positive relationship with a caring adult that relationship, social support. Trauma experts uh, for years were kind of fascinated by the fact that trauma victims in Japan recovered quite well in comparison to trauma victims in say Western kinds of countries. And one of their conclusions was that the reason Japanese survivors did as well as they did was because the social network was so tight. They have very strong social support. And we know that in many Western countries, certainly, although maybe we could say it's true around the world, social connection is kind of, is being degraded, is deteriorating. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so that is, that's a challenge. You have to get them that relationship. So getting back to the counselor and the framework, 
do they have access to you know, positive relationships with people who are like themselves? Do they have an appropriate level of challenge in their settings so that they are um, have the opportunity to learn things that they haven't mastered yet, but are ready for? And do they have the opportunity, is there some flexibility for them so that when they are ready to move on or they're ready to learn something new that is available to them? And then the fourth thing I would say is, are there individual or personalized circumstances for that person that could be contributing to their difficulties or that might need some address? Because as I said, you know, gifted kids come from all kinds of backgrounds. And just because you're gifted doesn't mean that you're not going to have trouble if your parents are getting divorced or, you know, if you've got um, a brother who has got a serious medical condition. You know, we're all impacted by what happens in our environment. Yeah, thank you. Does that help? Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Um, you wrote very interesting research paper entitled The Growing Up Smart and Criminal. Uh -huh. Yeah. And for me, this is very interesting uh, topic, but also raise a number of questions. First of all, sure. what motivates you to write this? Uh, what motivated me to write it, um, I don't know if you know this, I, I, in early in my clinical career, I spent about 10 years working with juvenile homicide offenders, some of whom were gifted. So I worked with teenagers who had killed somebody and not all of them, but some of them were very, very bright kids. And that was in the nineties. And during that time, Columbine happened in the US. You know, we had a number of high profile high school shootings. So there was a lot of buzz in the country and around the world about um, kids who are killing people and kids who are, um, super predators and uh, there was a lot of misinformation, I thought. So because of the work I was doing with the homicide offenders, I myself was having to really think through how did it happen that this very bright kid who comes from a very nice family killed somebody? How, how did that happen? Uh, so I, did, I, I didn't find a lot of uh, writing about that. I didn't find a lot of research, clinical kind of work about that. But of course, there is a very large body of literature about antisocial personality and why some people become criminals. Um, so when the Tracy Cross, and uh, there's another, I'm sorry, I, I space it at the moment, there were um, two editors approach me about writing a chapter for this book on morality, I thought, oh, this is information that a lot of people aren't really familiar with. So maybe it would be useful to write about that, how people don't just show up as criminals, they grow up. So how do you recognize a budding criminal? How do you tell the difference between a teenager who's just got a rebellious streak and a teenager who's really in serious trouble and on his or her way to becoming um, quite a aggressive kind of criminal. And what are the outcomes of this uh, piece of research? Oh, well, that's, um, that's a big question, because here it's, um, let me just say, say this, Samanow is one of the, he wrote a little book for parents called Before It's Too Late, which I would recommend to any teacher or parent who uh, wants a more thorough kind of discussion that's very accessible. Uh, you can recognize some of the signs of um, sort of the potential for criminality as early as preschool. Uh, but generally, I would say that the thing to look out for is a child who's got a repeated pattern of breaking the rules, a repeated pattern of breaking the rules and violating the norms, the social norms uh, for, you know, for behavior and also one who's got an attitude of entitlement, um, always blaming others, not willing to take responsibility, never in the wrong. You know, the example I sometimes give to teachers is you can think about the fourth grade, you know, a child who's nine, 10 years old, who uh, maybe has been stealing in the classroom or cheating. Um, several times and you confront that child and most kids will break down and cry or feel very bad about um, what they've done you know they'll feel some genuine remorse 
The child that I would be more concerned about is the child who begins to immediately lay blame, gets aggressive, attacking you. You've got no right to say that to me. I didn't do that. You're lying. Really defiant. Uh, that's a serious kind of concern at that age. Yeah. And I think uh, this uh, led me to ask about irresponsible creative people. Mm. Is it, um, uh, you can consider it a crime or something different? I'm sorry, repeat that again for me, will you? I said, do you, what do you think about irresponsible creative people who are working yeah. in different fields of knowledge and industry and then there might be something wrong coming out. It could we consider this as part of this story when we talk about criminal gifted people and the creative people? Mm, well, I think it's I think it's more complex than that, actually. I don't mm -hmm. I think we'd be erring to try to simplify it to that degree because there's you were now talking about ethics, what's criminality. Um, what are simply ethical lapses, moral dilemmas? It gets, it gets pretty complicated. Because I think we have to recommend, you know, uh, to the people, they have to study this piece of research in depth in order to find out what are the main implications for school and community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and you know, and the good news is that it's especially at an adolescent level, when the kids are still in school, there's a lot you can do. We know a lot about intervention, what's appropriate intervention. The challenge is having the will, the political will to deliver the intervention in the school system. We had here where I'm living right now in Montana, we had one of the first national studies many years ago, back in, oh my gosh, it must've been 30 years ago, um, with an intervention program in the school for about 40 kids who, in, in a high school, 40 kids who were on this trajectory. They were really headed for a life, a potential life of criminality. And we know from the research in pri with prison populations that these kinds of intervention, their cognitive, cognitive behavioral interventions are very effective. They're really quite effective, but a lot of people are not aware of them. I mean, people, just the general public are not aware that you really can impact them, but you have to be willing to put the resources to deliver them. Yeah, very true. You know, and in some cultures, they'd rather lock people up. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. So based on the second edition of your book about the social emotional development of gifted children, what do we know? Mm -hmm. What are the main messages and key recommendations of that book? I read the book in the third edition, and now I have uh -huh. to read again the second edition. Uh, <laughs> but uh, from one of the main contributors, I would like to hear you know the main messages and key recommendations sure. of this book. Sure. Well, said, you, it is, uh, it is very well known. It is very well known and published, very popular, you know, book. <laughs> Well, Tazir, you've been in the field long enough. I think you know that you're already familiar with the main messages. The, the main messages are, the most important messages are that gifted kids are not all the same. There's different types of gifted kids. And we make a mistake when we try to generalize across gifted children. Um, there are a few similarities across all gifted children, but there are lots of differences and lots of different profiles of gifted children and types of gifted children. And your area of talent makes a difference. A creatively gifted child is different from a child might maybe who is um, more gifted perhaps in, um, oh, let's say um, science or uh, mathematics, perhaps, you know, creatively gifted child who's verbally gifted, it might be very different from a mathematically talented child. So we can't generalize, that's the first point, you can't generalize across all gifted children. And then what we've already talked about a little bit, culture and context makes a big difference. It really matters a lot. So it's very important to pay attention to culture and context. Um, and then then the, the um, other points again are the importance of access to true peers and the importance of having challenge in the curriculum. Now, 
a couple of other finer points are that there are some characteristics of gifted children that can be tricky for them, can present some challenges in a lot of different contexts, like perfectionism, for, for instance. We know that most gifted people are perfectionistic. Not, I mean, by perfectionism, maybe I need to uh, clarify that. I mean that they are able to see an ideal. They're able to see what would really be best. And they are quite eager to pursue that. They, they want to they want to see that happen. Now, in some cases that can become paralyzing. Uh, there's two kinds of perfectionism, there's kind of a good kind of perfectionism and a bad kind of perfectionism. And we tend to be familiar with the bad kind of perfectionism that paralyzes people and keeps them from achieving what they could achieve. But there's also a very motivating kind of perfectionism in which case you wanna get something just right. Um, and so that can present some challenges. Uh, also gifted, children as a group can be um, rather intense in some ways. They can have an, they might be intellectually intense. Like for my, myself, I would say I'm rather intense intellectually. I've got this very strong drive of curiosity that just will not quit. And, you know, sometimes I have to learn to let go. One of the things I had to learn in Singapore where, you know, the workload is very challenging how much they, they want you to do. I had to really come to grips with some things just need to be done. There are things I can do that need to be done very, very well. And there are some things that just need to be done and be able to let that go. You know, that's, that's something that I had to uh, really master while I was there in order to do well in that setting. Uh, yeah, the book covers um, a lot of smaller topics that we don't have time to get into today, but I would say those are probably the, the, main, the main messages. Um, I keep coming back to that culture and context because a lot of people wanna generalize. And boy, you don't have to go very far to realize that that environment really matters a great deal and what's available. Do they have access to other people like themselves? Do they have challenge in the, in the curriculum? I think you answered an additional question when I was about to say, or I am about to ask you about the level of uh, good perfectionism you have. Oh. <laughs> because I think you are, you are a perfectionist scholar. Yeah, maybe. My, my, Not I, maybe I know people. Who... We, have, <laughs> we have evidence. We have an evidence, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> which topics you have? Uh, which topics have received little or no attention? For example, gifted girls, uh, special needs, preschool potentially gifted, yeah. advantage gifted yeah. students, and so on. Yeah, there's there's so many things that we don't know about. Um, again, you know, most of the research has been done in three countries. So we know really very little about, most of the international research has been done in three countries. And it's getting better. I mean, I'm seeing a lot more research come out of Asia, a lot more research coming out of France in the last, uh, Germany in the last 10 years in particular, Europe and Asia, there's a lot more research. We still have very little research, I think, coming out of other countries, other parts of the world. And um, and then maybe it was very, unfortunately, very little research on intervention, you know, what works really, and I mean rigorous research about what works. And this is a problem, not just in gifted education, this is a challenge in education and psychology uh, generally, but that's, and there's a number of reasons for that, but we keep kind of, I think there's a tendency to keep visiting some of the same issues rather than really try to pull together the teams to do the intervention research. One of the reasons I think intervention research is not done, but I've done intervention research and I'll tell you, it's really difficult to do, not in gifted education, but um, to do a randomized controlled study, you know, with, with a team and a, a sample that's large enough. Um, there have been some studies done, but it's difficult to do. And getting funding for it is difficult to do. And so a lot of people continue 
to do research with small samples and do survey kind of research because it's what they can get done quickly and get published. You know, academics are the ones doing a large part of the research and they are under a lot of pressure to publish. And so you do the research that you can get published fast enough rather than doing the research maybe that really needs to get done. And uh, do you think that gifted education suffers uh, inertia? Oh, I don't know. You know, I've been kind of out of it for uh, out of the gifted education research for several years now. So I really don't think I could speak to that. I don't know enough about it. Your uh, general impression. Well, I like the fact, I wouldn't say probably that it suffers from inertia. I like the fact that we've got this um, edge, a very growing edge in talent psychology, the psychology of performance. Um, I think that's really important and very valuable. And I think that will grow because it's very applicable and it resonates with people across cultures and contexts. It's gonna make sense. It's gonna have face validity for people. But you talk about cross-cultural and we know uh, most of research and initiatives comes from the US. Mm -hmm. And we might have like what we call cultural dominance. Yeah, oh, for sure. For sure. For sure, and it also, you, you know, you've had enough experience with academia to know it's, you know, it's a game. Uh, the pub, it's a publishing game. And it's a game you have to learn how to play to survive as an academic. And journal editors control what gets published. I mean, there's been recent articles in the last five years about the challenges that we face to getting unpopular research published. You know, if you, if you get, to, if you find out uh, that your results that, uh, so let's say you do replication, like the call for replication studies. We know that in, in uh, psychological research, for example, and educational research, there's a huge need for replication studies. Well, good luck trying to get a replication study published, yeah. right? And so unless journal editors commit to publishing a certain amount of replication studies, people are not gonna do replication research because you can't get published and then you don't survive as a researcher. Oh, yeah. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a big challenge. I don't know what the answer is to that. Uh, so at the end of this interview, first of all, we are so proud of you, Maureen Nehar, uh, of your success. And I would like to thank you so much on behalf of the International Center for Innovation in Education. And I would like to give you a few minutes to conclude this interview by some suggestions or recommendations you would like to offer or to introduce. Mm. Well, uh, what, I, what I have to suggest or recommend or just what I wanna share uh, is not specific to gifted education. I wanna talk about the pandemic for a moment. And I really wanna urge people, parents, teachers, everybody to not waste the pandemic. As difficult as the circumstances are, it's also, I think, really important that we view it as an opportunity. It's really a gift in a way that we should embrace in whatever way we can. I don't mean to minimize the suffering that is going on among people who have lost their jobs, people who don't know how they're gonna feed their kids through the pandemic. Uh, I, I think about that every day, the millions and millions of people who have lost their jobs, who are really worried about um, their futures. At the same time, it's uh, important that we not waste it. It's an opportunity to live our values in front of our children. We, we try to teach our certain values to our kids. Now is our opportunity to live them. Let our children see what really counts when things get, when life gets very difficult. Let them see you living out your values in action. Um, if you're a person of faith, this is an opportunity to take those teachable moments and let your children see you living out your faith um, day to day as you deal with the pandemic. I really have appreciate such you know high 
uh, highly uh, appreciate this uh, recommendation. So thank you so much, uh, my dear friend, and we hope to see you again in another interview. Thank you very much, Tazir. Really thank appreciate you. it. It was a privilege to participate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.